What's up, Ego Hackers? Welcome to the show. Uh, tonight's episode is Season 18, Cognitive Mechanics. We're going to be discussing the body temple and its cognitive origins, which is great because I enjoy body temple types. Body temple types are the ENTJ, the ISFP, the ESFJ, and the INTP. And uh, having an opportunity uh, for... Uh, getting to know those types uh, throughout my life. I mean, you know, except my sister, uh, who is an ESFJ. Um, I mean, predominantly, I've had a pretty good experience. I really enjoy INTPs. I like how supportive they are. I like how, up until, you know, they pull out the chair out from underneath. But until then, they're, they're amazing. And uh, I think overall, it's been really great uh to have the opportunity to work with, to love, uh, to be friends with uh, Body Temple. I mean, I'm Heart Temple, so I'm like mega co compatible with Body Temple people. I really appreciate uh, the amount of time and effort that they put into leaving a legacy behind. Uh, also, trying to ultimately contribute to some kind of creative outcome in some capacity. A creative outcome that is not only memorable, but a creative outcome that could actually change uh, literally how human beings live their lives on a daily basis. You know, not like, you know, Steve Wozniak, who is an INTP, who invented with Steve Jobs and sold this thing that can hack telephones, and they built it and sold it as a way to fund uh, Apple, you know, in the beginning. And then now we have uh, their greatest legacy, which is literally the camera uh, for this live stream, which is wirelessly transmitting to this laptop right now without a wire on uh, this uh, IT, uh, iPhone 14 Pro, which I'm very thankful to have. So thank you, Body Temple. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, sure, may have been Steve Jobs' vision, but without the Body Temple, there is no execution, there is no implementation. And that's one of the things that I don't think people give Body Temple enough credit for. Uh, I think when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, what the Body Temple ends up leaving behind, it really just is the culmination. Uh, it, it's very culminating. It's a culminating uh, temple. Uh, and it's the culmination of things that... Uh, the finality of it, right? Um, just watching it all come together in one big cohesive system or one big work of art, which still ultimately follows the system. I mean, even an ISFP painter has a certain system or methodology that they have, which basically is expressed through their style. Their style itself is a system. And that's one thing that uh, I think a lot of people don't even realize about ISFPs because of the amount of order that is brought within their art, it's not so chaotic, right? It's really not chaotic. Whereas if you look at like ISTP art, for example, or ESTP art, uh, it's either very chaotic or it is something that is, you know, very fleeting, right? It doesn't last very long. It's not, uh, it's not as indefinite, basically. However, Body Temple seriously believes in like the perspective of built to last. And being able to like generally have uh, a good understanding or a good example from popular culture uh, within the body temple, I would recommend that you watch uh, the exchange between two members of Akatsuki, which is uh, Deidara and Sasori uh, of the Red Sand. Uh, these two characters within uh, the series Naruto uh, Shippuden, which is the second Naruto series out of the four Naruto series uh, out there, I'm not sure if the fourth series with the time jump has even been released yet, uh, but or the time skip, but is the second series with the first time skip basically in the entire storyline. And basically these two characters are members of a terrorist organization who are collecting weapons of mass destruction in order to ultimately take over the world because of the ideals uh, set forth behind their organization, basically. And... Uh, these two characters, um, Daidara, he is a bomber, uh, 
and uh, he makes the argument that art is basically something that is fleeting. It's something that lasts in an instant and then it's gone. And that's the memory that you take with you. Whereas Sasori was making the argument that no, art is something that actually lasts forever. And you have to go out of your way to make it last forever. Otherwise, it's not really art. Because Daidara, he was a bomber. He'd take uh, balls of clay, which were basically plastic explosive, and he'd turn them into like exploding cats or exploding raccoons or some kind of silly animal thing was his art basically then it would just blow up and then it's like oh that was a really great uh, a great memory etc right well so sorry's point is like no the art that is actually produced is something that needs to ultimately you know be left behind and this is in my opinion like one of the arguments um that i'm not entirely sure which other temple would have this argument it's funny though because like Railgun, she is a bartender. She is learning how to become a mixologist right now. She's extremely talented. She'll take any random ingredients and basically figure out something completely unique, completely original. And it's liquid art, basically. That's basically her art. And uh, she's, she's, she's basically a genius uh, when it comes uh, to mixology. I've never met anyone who is more of a genius uh, in that field uh, with the with the raw talent ever in my entire life, and she's just entirely creative for it. And she will make the argument. She will support Daydara's argument, saying that okay, yeah, like art is something that lasts that that just lasts in an instant, right? And that's and that's like you got to be able to put all of your focus and all of your effort and all of your energy into making this one thing that's creative, so that is so great and it's so overwhelming that that person is impacted forever, even though it lasts only an instant. But the fact that it lasts an instant is what makes it so great to begin with. Whereas if something lasts forever, like potentially a painting, for example, like a Mona Lisa, etc., or or a Vermeer uh, or a Van Gogh, uh, etc., these different kinds of things, you know, from like an artistic uh, point of view. You know, those things last, uh, last a long time. You know, you can gawk at it, but does it really have the same essence? Does it really have the same exact quality as something that lasts in an instant? And this argument right here, I think, is ultimately what ends up plaguing members of the body temple. Oftentimes, I see them being pulled back and forth between the two sides of this argument uh, throughout their lives, right? And it's interesting because you have the ISFP at the forefront who uh, really, at the beginning of their life, they actually start out with uh, making art that just, you know, lasts for an instant. And then it's towards the end of their lives, they're like, oh, wow, I need to go out of my way to make something that will build to last, right? Where it's the complete opposite when you look at ENTJs. ENTJs, they do the entire opposite. It's all about like, hey... I'm going to make something built to last. And they start out that way in their lives. And then towards the end of their life, they're like, eh, nah, it's, it's fine. Like I can still make a huge impact with expert sensing child. I'll still be memorable anyway, even if it's, this is one thing that's like super, like it's instantly consumed and there's, and that's just the way it is, but it will be so beautiful and so vibrant that everyone will remember it. You know, consequently, when you look at the INTP and the ESFJ, they, they have this thing where it's like, okay, yeah, they could, they could be consumers of art. In some cases, they could be uh, producers of art. Um, the INTP, because of their ISFP superego, they really, really have the perspective of going all out because it's a superego, it's another ego. And then eventually, it's all about building that lasting legacy for the long term. ESFJ, it's not so much. ESFJ is more on the Daidara side of the argument. It's more like, okay, I can have things that last a little while, but it's not important for it to last forever. And so it's oftentimes why ESFJs, especially ESFJ women, focus on having family being their legacy. But family doesn't exactly last forever, now doesn't it, right? So there, these are a lot of different um, you know, ways of interpreting the different perspectives within the body temple itself and how uh, these different types actually interact, um, um, you know, interact uh, with art and what they're leaving behind and the kind of uh, memories that they want to be remembered for, ultimately. Um, so, yeah, um, that's kind of where we're at with, so... And thank you all for uh, those of you who decided to uh, join us this evening. So, 
All right, cool. But yeah, this is season 18, episode 27, The Body Temple Cognitive Origins, Discovery and Purpose. So again, what is the Body Temple all about? The Body Temple focuses on legacy and achievement, and these types view the world's problems as stemming from a lack of motivation toward inspired action, right? The Body Temple worships creation and tangible outcomes and experiences, but it's it's a little bit more than just that. It's It's kind of like from the perspective of being memorable. And it's so interesting to me, like you look at, you look at greed types like ISFP and ENTJ and they, they, they collect memorabilia. Whereas like the SE child gives memorabilia to other people, but the ISFP ends up collecting memorabilia over time just so they can be sentimental about things because sentiment matters a lot to them. And there's a lot of sentiment that's attached to their totems and they become very attached to those certain things to the point where they're like, oh, that's really important to me. I'm not willing to let go of that. Whereas the ENTJ is like deciding for themselves what should be important to other people, right? It's like kind of this F.E. demon thing where it's like, hey, I'm using it's the demonic child. I'm going to use my child function of my demon and like I get to choose what's important to you. That's it. And then sometimes they can go out of the way where it's like, okay, actually, I'm going to humble myself and use my ISFP side and then find out specifically what is important to you. And this is why uh, their cognitive origin is the cognitive origin of purpose, which has the love language of gift giving, you know, it's the gifts, 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 right? And watching ENTJs and ISFPs give gifts is one of the greatest things. And, you know, they go, they go really well with acts of service types because I'm an active service type. Um, and you know, ENTPs and ISFJs are all about acts of service and, um, Acts of service types, the ultimate act of service that anyone could do for an acts of service type is to give them a gift. And remember, guys, what the difference between a gift and a present actually is. A present is something that you choose to give to somebody, whereas a gift is something that you're giving to somebody based on what they actually want, right? And designing something based on what they want. And it's so interesting to me that the ISFP, out of all the 16 types, is the absolute best at giving gifts, hands down. It, but it's so interesting that they have extroverted intuition trickster, which is aware, uh, which is like very foolishly aware of the desires of other people, right? And yet somehow they're able to give the best gifts out of all of the 16 types. It's kind of miraculous if you think about it, right? Um, it's one of the reasons why when you combine the ISFP and the ENTP in the context of a sexual relationship, it becomes the natural pair that ends up becoming the uh, engine of miracles. They, when they get together, they produce miracles because it's combining the gift giving with the acts of service, the, the super mega gift giving of the ISFP with the uh, acts of service guidance, outcome guidance of the ENTP and the ultimate future for what someone would want with their any hero. And then it literally ends up creating a miracle so that this, this couple ends up producing specific miracles for individual people. If you want to learn more about that, I recommend you watch season 14, part three, uh, in the seventh episode of that, um, which would be um, the ENTP and ISFP relationship lecture, if you haven't watched that already. Also, starting this month for the premium lectures, we're going to be deep diving into Octogram and going to be explaining the four variants of Octogram according to the 16 types. So this is a 16 episode season We'll be doing it for the next eight months, basically two episodes a month. It is available here in the members section at csjoseph.life forward slash portal uh, in the journeyman area. So keep that in mind. So the cognitive origins of discovery and purpose are the two primary tools uh, by this temple to implement their vision for building a legacy and leaving something behind worth remembering. It, ultimately, it is to be memorable. Although, you know, in the, for the sake of being memorable, I've seen women who are part of Body Temple go out of their way and when they're initiating divorce with men to take everything that those men have because it's their legacy. And that's like the excuse that they tell them and themselves. And it's like, no, it's not their legacy. Like what they have to understand is that like Body Temple women need to get to a point where it's like, it's not their personal legacy. It's not, it's actually their man's legacy. Whichever man they belong to, it's about their man's legacy and them being a part and sharing in that legacy. It's not their own personal legacy that they themselves will get credit for. That's just not how the world works. 
It's just not how their biology works. It's just not how it, it works at all. Um, I like, even though we have plenty of female entrepreneurs, uh, the only potential female executive that I even know of or is like the CEO of Canva or Sheryl Sandberg at Facebook. And I only remember Sheryl Sandberg at Facebook in a derogatory way, not actually in a positive way. The CEO of Canva, I do remember her in a positive way. But the thing is, is that when if you think about the collective unconscious of man and how the collective unconscious remembers things, who, which woman is ultimately, it doesn't matter how much of a feminist society you live in, which woman is really going to be remembered for entrepreneurship? None of them. And as much as no one goes to women's basketball games because our race just naturally just doesn't care. We don't care about female basketball. We don't care about female entrepreneurs. So these women end up gaslighting themselves into thinking that that's what actually matters from a legacy perspective from the body temple. It's not how they're going to be remembered. We know this. We've been, we were past the 1900s. We're almost a quarter of the way through uh, the first century, the 21st century, you know, uh, in, uh, you know, past the year 2000. And literally what, what has happened? Like what, what's going on here? Like, are we really honoring or remembering female entrepreneurs? We've had plenty of time go by where women have had more choices and more opportunity to become female entrepreneurs and, quote, leave something behind, especially those ENTJ women out there. And the reality of the situation is, I'm sorry to say, folks, no one cares. No one cares. So stop trying to usurp the body temple legacy for yourselves, girls. Stop doing that. You need to actually tack on your purpose onto your man's legacy and create a shared legacy instead of trying to make it and be greedily by doing it by making it your own, trying to take all the credit or having your name on it. As much as you may succeed in actually having your name on it, the collective unconscious of mankind, biologically speaking, will not care enough. Sorry. I don't know what else to tell you. That's a fact. That's like you're, it's like you're literally trying to get the human race to care about women's basketball. And let me tell you something. If I'm going to watch a female sport, it's going to be beach volleyball at the Summer Olympics for obvious reasons. Okay? So I'm sorry to say it's a man's world and our race, it's a male-dominated race from how these social constructs happen. This is not social conditioning. This is natural biology. We just don't care because where men lead, women follow. Men in general are not really interested in women's basketball, okay? So what this means is, is that where men lead, women follow. And because men are not interested in watching women's basketball, women in general are not interested in watching women's basketball. So stop kidding yourself and thinking that you're going to be this great female entrepreneur with my legacy. Because even if you succeed at doing that, nobody is going to care. No one's going to care. I'm sorry. So you need to tack your purpose on to basically your man's legacy and stop making it about you. This is a big issue, okay? It's a big problem. So if you're going to be building a legacy, there's, there's, there's so many different ways of doing it, right? Obviously, the cognitive origin of discovery and purpose are there to do that. But, like, I get, this is just some of the ways, like, you know, like, how feminism has destroyed the body temple, basically. Uh, especially, especially like, because I, I know a few couples who are, like, INTP, ENTJ, right? I know, I want, I know one particular, actually, I know two particular couples. Um, Interestingly enough, I had sex with the ENTJ woman in one of those couples with the permission of the INTP man, um, which statistically is the most likely to be willing to be cucked also, which is kind of not necessarily a good thing. Um, but uh, it, it was with permission. Um, and her and I were together for about a year. And that was that was really great um, when I had that opportunity. And that was like when I was like 27. So uh but, you know, even then, like, she understood that, like, you know, I shouldn't be taking away his legacy, even though she threatened him to do that at one point in time. And then she's like, no, 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 his legacy 
actually there's more meaning with his legacy. People will remember him more so than they would remember me. She actually came to those same conclusions that I'm trying to explain to you folks now. So then she decided to stick by him, stick by their family, focus on their children, and focus on providing relief to her husband as well as helping him think about things properly and organize things properly, even managing him in certain areas in order to increase his ability to go even further uh, with his legacy. But like, here's another example. Just look at Elon Musk. Explain to me all of the ENTJ women that Elon Musk has had a sexual relationship with. Oh, wait, you'd probably find none because those ENTJ women are so feminized that they would actually try to usurp his legacy, right? So even in the context of this body temple golden pair, the ENTJ to the INTP, it's definitely something that's just going to blow up in your face, right? It's like, it's, it's entirely, entirely ridiculous. So it's, it's a problem, you know? And oftentimes like people are not even, they're just not even aware they're not even aware of these of these implications, you know. So I, I, I often hurt. I hurt for the body temple. I hurt how because like feminism has absolutely destroyed the body temple, big time. The heart temple, it's it's been able to get through it. Honestly, like my temple, eh, we can deal with feminism, no problem. I mean, we we've been able to deal with it. It's not a big deal. Mind temple, yeah, mind temple's been able to handle feminism really well. It's soul temple. Uh, and it's and it's body temple that really really struggle the most with feminism hands down, where you have uh, the most masculine uh, types uh, for women basically being represented uh, in those in those two areas, as well as the most masculine of the men being represented in those two areas, and the masculine men are being neutered basically, while the uh, you know while the feminine women are are being told you know to to be more masculine, et cetera. It, it just ends up becoming a serious, serious problem. And like, just like what we saw actually recently with the Discord server, um, there is a, there's a woman by the name of Book uh, and her brother, her twin brother, Forrest, but uh, Book is on the CSJ Discord and she is a very masculine woman and she never really got the opportunity to have support uh, in her femininity because she's been conditioned to lean into her innate natural masculinity as an ESTP woman. Not unlike what happened to Railgun, actually. Uh, they, her and Railgun also have the same octogram, uh, which is objectification um, uh, lust, basically. Objectification lust. And uh, so that's SDUF, basically. So from an SDUF octogram perspective, they're really just set up for failure by their family, by society, uh, in order to like act a certain way as, you know, as women and whatnot. And, but, but body temple, it just, it really, really crushes them because they have someone who's hyper feminine, who is an ESFJ in the body temple. But then you have someone who's hyper masculine, which is an ENTJ at the same time. And then you yeah, have the ISFP, who's this masculine feminine hybrid, right? Um, they're, they're, it's, like a, it's like those uh, tropes, you know, you have chaotic good, neutral good, et cetera. Well, the ISFP is like almost like true neutral to a point. They can go masculine, they can go feminine, like on a dime. They can, they can make, they can adjust how they look in that way. You know, the INTP, uh, so, but the ISFP is slightly a little bit more masculine uh, than feminine, technically on paper. The INTP is slightly a little bit more feminine than they are masculine, technically on paper. And this is just within the context of the body temple itself, not compared to any of the other types, just within the context of the body temple. Uh, so it ends up creating this push me, pull you type of situation where you have this spectrum of masculinity versus femininity, right? But again, because of this push me, pull you uh, dynamic, it ends up causing a lot of damage and ends up destroying the cognitive origins of these four types, discovery and purpose. You know, the women assume that their purpose uh, is to leave a legacy behind or go all out on their discovery, right? Uh, or the men, uh, the men assume that they have to sacrifice their legacy for the sake of women, basically. Uh, or they have to sacrifice their discovery and their exploration for the sake of women. Because the men are basically being turned into 
uh, Homer Simpson and Peter Griffin, basically, because that is the societal issue. This is why I have a huge personal problem with Seth MacFarlane. Uh, I think um, I think while I enjoy that he challenges the cultural norms often and actually puts them to the test, he still actually believes in the normalcy bias that is presented by our bullshit Hollywood influenced uh, culture. You know, as much as I say, like, you know, my friend refers to Hollywood or anything that you watch on television as like the electric Jew, because it is ultimately Jewish culture that is uh, impacting. And then Jewish culture is hella feminized, very hella feminized, especially with the teachings from the Talmud, basically, which talk about how, uh, you know, family inheritance is through their mothers. It's not through their fathers and that kind of thing. And men are just kind of ultimately cucked within the context of their belief system. Um, Talmudic Jews, basically. And, uh, you know, and because ultimately they have, you know, their, 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 their cartel or their good old boys club within the context of Hollywood, they get to make these propaganda related, Edward Bernaysian related decisions when it comes to the content that they actually produce out of Hollywood. And it all fits that cultural narrative that these Jews subscribe to, right? I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying that that's ultimately the engine of feminism. It's uh, it's Jezebelian thinking, Jezebel being a false prophetess uh, in the Old Testament of the Bible. And you couldn't even be a man in her inner, inner circle unless you became a eunuch, basically. That was it. That was literally, that was literally like the cost. Um, you lose your genitalia. Basically, you are emasculated permanently just to be in her process. A man would basically lose her legacy, right? And that's the point I'm trying to make. Like the conflict within the body temple is ultimately causing a huge amount of destruction from the perspective of culture, because what is being left behind is ultimately the death of masculinity and the death of femininity because of Hollywood's toxic connection to the body temple itself and because the body temple represents the culmination and the execution of all of these ideas people are suffering right now people are suffering people are losing their masculinity they're losing their femininity and ultimately it's going to lead to this huge disaster a new legacy a legacy of death basically okay and that is our collective future because we um are not providing challenge, much less even allowed to challenge the Jezebelian uh, feminist thinking that is coming out of Hollywood, right? You know, much to the dismay of many out there who are being persecuted for it, which is a huge problem. And oftentimes people don't even, they're not even aware of these consequences, right? Because of just, you know, someone else's cultural narrative is being pushed onto everyone else's cultural narrative and everyone else's cultural narrative is being lost to the melting pot of Western society. And when those cultural narratives are gone, everyone is being forced to adopt a cultural narrative of, a, a, of another culture that really doesn't want to have anything to do with anyone to begin with, right? Which is a problem. It's a huge problem. And we're not even aware of how we're being conditioned through the body temple to be this culmination of cultural conditioning that is leading to the destruction of our innate masculinity and femininity within the human race. And ultimately, it's leading to the destruction of our future. Why else do you think that it says in the last days, I will send my prophet Elijah to you and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their sons and the hearts of sons to their fathers. That means bring back masculinity. I will bring back, Elijah will bring back masculinity. And then, or else, I will strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Why is it that the land is being struck? It's literally God cursing the body temple because the land is the great introverted sensing it is the earth or Genesis 3.16. It talks about how the earth is cursed. Cursed is the ground, the earth. Cursed is the earth because of you. And by the sweat of your brow and through your toil, you will eat of it the rest of your life and then you will die. That is the male burden of performance. You cannot have the male burden of performance without masculinity. If you destroy masculinity and you destroy masculinity's reward for being masculinity, which is femininity, actually, 
having a feminine woman is a reward for being a masculine man. If you take the reward away, if you take away the essence of what it is to be masculine, to be masculine, if you take that away from a man, then ultimately everything suffers. The entire earth suffers basically without that masculinity because order is basically descending into chaos. And the great order is the body temple itself. It represents the great order, okay? It is the result. It is the proof that chaos and ultimately the earth, the earth's chaos has been subdued basically. But because of the lack of masculinity, that means there is no order, which means the land of course would fall into utter death, decay, destruction, and ultimately chaos, right? It would literally decay. And that would be a serious problem, don't you think? That'd be a serious problem. And again, this is the importance of the body temple. This is what the body temple brings, okay? And these are all these different little dangers that come into play here, right? Oftentimes, people don't even understand where it's at. So, Lev, while that may be true about Kara, did he have children with her? Okay, there you go. So yeah. Um. Anyway, this is this is why it's this is why it's a really really big deal, you know. So you guys have to understand, you know, the battle for masculinity and femininity is really ultimately being fought at the body temple level. It really is. It is, it is it is the battleground for masculinity and femininity. It really is. Um, even though the soul temple is the most masculine of the temples, it still it still doesn't matter. It's it's really the body temple where the battle is being fought. And heart temple, while well, we go out of our way to not be heartless, and uh, you know, like you know, we're like the cheerleaders of the sixteen types. If you actually think about it, we're just big cheerleaders. You know, heart temple, we're 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 the cheerleaders. Um, we can, we can bring the horse to the water as we're cheering the horse to get to the water, but the horse still has to make the drink. The heart temple is not really going to be able to do much about it. The mind temple may be able to provide guidance to the horse to get the horse to the water, but the water the horse may still not to drink. It's the body temple where the, where the execution happens, where the decision is actually made that causes the horse to actually drink the water. And the horse itself is the soul temple, basically. You see what I'm saying? The action produced by the soul temple is the body temple. It is the order. That's why it's a culmination, right? This is why I have such an extended introduction for this particular lecture because the body temple carries this insane amount of importance because the body temple is the ultimate actual result. It is the result. And these cognitive origins of discovery and purpose are absolutely central to this result. It's absolutely a big deal. So let's, let's discuss the origins. Cognitive origins are the eight primary desires of humanity. Our origin feels, feels everything we seek and it is the whole that each of us is trying to fill. So cognitive being concerned with the act or process of knowing, perceiving, etc., or two, relating to the mental processes of perception, memory, judgment, and reasoning. Origin being uh, something from which anything arises or is derived, a source or a fountainhead, <coughs> or two, the first stage of existence, beginning, or the point in the Cartesian coordinate system where the axes intersect. We could replace cognitive with soul, giving us the origin of our soul. The cognitive origin becomes that which for our souls are made. So the point is, is that like, we are made to find our cognitive origins and the cognitive origins specific to the body temple are discovery, also known as exploration, as well as purpose, right? What a person's purpose actually is. And that means everything to them. Like if you take away purpose from an ENTJ, they're going to want to kill themselves. You take away purpose from an ISFP, they're going to want to kill themselves. I've seen it many times. In fact, my ISFP friend Conrad just killed himself recently because he lost his purpose. He tacked on his purpose to being a husband. He packed on his uh, uh, purpose to being an entrepreneur. He tacked on his purpose to being a dad. And the woman in his life basically questioned all of that all at one time with her TI parent and absolutely crushed him. And he got into his car and drove off as fast as he can and went right over a cliff and he died. Because he just didn't feel like he was worth it anymore. If everyone thinks so little of me, why do I even bother? 
And it's like, if I'm going to do the time, I may as well do the crime, right? It's why bother syndrome from the INTP superego. But he took a little bit further. The ISFP interpretation of that is, why do I even bother? If everyone thinks I'm incapable of doing this thing, then I'm not going to do this thing. If everyone thinks I'm incapable of living life and being a good person in life, I'm going to end myself so that other people do not have to be harmed by my presence. He was basically gaslit into killing himself to a point. Gaslit by friends, family, society, even members of his immediate family. Rest in power, brother. So, that's what happens when he is purposeless. What happens when an INTP can't discover anymore or even an ESFJ? What happens if there's nothing left to explore? They just give up. They just completely give up. And they just sit around and consume. That's all it is. Why bother producing? Because there's nothing new to produce. If everything is... If everything is the same under the sun, why bother? Why bother? That's why I kind of disagree with King Solomon about that. While there may be nothing new under the sun, humanity as it collectively forgets its memory. And there's things that, that's, that's why discovery is always fresh because things have to be rediscovered over and all because humanity is forgetful. We are forgetful. So let's look at discovery deeper. Discovery is the first origin in the body temple belonging to the ESFJ and INTP dyad. Discovery is the cutting edge. It is exploration, whether one's personal internal explorations or the actual pioneer edge of an undiscovered place. This dyad is constantly seeking the thrill of novelty and to bring something back from the foggy edges to share with the rest of us. Understanding the technical meaning of discovery arises from examining the four poles of discovery, which is generativity, gluttony, hedonism, and servility, as they are the four tools the ESFJ and I and INTP used to achieve discovery. So let's look at generativity. Generativity represents the ESFJs and INTPs ability to find and create new products, discoveries, insights, and experiences. While in generativity, these types literally create exploration out of thin air and use that exploration to lead to concrete results. So basically like these people need to be in a state of consumption they, in order for them to come up with new ways, because like they're like they're taking an in input, like their TI is taking in TE input, but that TE input is based on exploring new things. And the new things they explore, they use that and they put it together like Legos, right? To create this nice little input package for their TI to process. And their TI is like, oh, dang, I have this realization. If I just put these things together, I can get XYZ result. And then they engineer these new results, basically not like creating a rocket ship, you know, with the SpaceX, with Elon Musk, right? That's just kind of how that works, right? And then there's gluttony. Gluttony is a response to a lack of available exploration, where the ESFJ and INTP go inward to consumption, finding discovery through all the different things they can consume and all the different ways that they can consume it. And then there's hedonism. Hedonism achieves discovery by following one's curiosity. Hedonistic ESFJs and INTPs allow their interests to spark their exploration, even when not met with other people's approval. When hedonistic, whether in generativity or gluttony, they appear to have addictive attributes, either to their work or their consumption, sometimes even both. Like, for example, hedonistic INTP men having uncontrollable pornography addictions. This is literally the types of people that need to learn how to fast. In fact, the ESFJ INTP dyad out of all the 16 types needs to have a regular fasting schedule more than all of the other 16 types or 14 other types combined. These types need to practice fasting the most. And then to be servile, ESFJs and INTPs lead with finding discovery and following and providing what others want. Servility makes these types seem extra selfless, sometimes annoyingly so, who go out of their way, often cheaply, in the pursuit of cultivating appreciation from others. They find fulfillment in serving others. <coughs> well, how could that be? Because servile, servile ESFJ and INTPs, they're like, it's like they're outsourcing. 
they're outsourcing their discovery to other people. They don't know what they themselves want to explore. So they're basically allowing other people to choose what they should explore for those others. <coughs> that's ultimately how it works. That's, that's how they survive. Whereas a hedonistic version of an ESFJ and an INTP is that they already know what they want to explore. They're going to explore it. They don't need other people to make that choice for them. They don't need to outsource their desire to those other people, to those third parties. Servile ones do, but hedonistic ones do not. Okay? That's what's happening there. Let's examine purpose for the ENTJ and the ISFP. So purpose is the second cognitive origin of the body temple belonging to the uh, ENTJ and the ISFP dyad. This dyad is seeking specific and tangible achievements where purpose is the combination of these goals, introverted intuition, extroverted thinking, and their freedom to express themselves through various pursuits, right? It's like pursuit is purpose. Pursuit is purpose, right? That's what it comes down to. So uh, first one is, is there a living virtue, which is generosity. And generosity represents the ENTJs and ISFPs willingness to invest in other people's purposes, right? Generous ENTJs and ISFPs use their knowledge and resources to inspire others to pursue their dreams and realize their visions for who they could be and what they could accomplish. Generous ENTJs and ISFPs find purpose in giving others their purpose and sharing their purpose. So remember, these two types are wayfarers. These types gather up for themselves treasure because they're wayfarers. And once they gather themselves up treasure, then they decide with whom is important to them enough to share their treasure with, right? And oftentimes, you know, their treasure ultimately is their purpose because it is written where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, right? So this is one of the reasons why, you know, treasure comes from the body temple, heart and passion comes from the heart temple, etc. This is why they go together. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, right? It's biblical. Check it out, all right? So pursuing their dreams and inspiring others to pursue their dreams, where they're being generous, they are investing in others to allow those other people to pursue their dreams as well, to pursue their purpose as well. Because remember, to the ENTJ and the ISFP, pursuits equal purpose. It's the same thing. Pursuit and purpose, they're the same. All right? Pursuit equals purpose. And if there's nothing for the ENTJ or the ISFP to pursue, they don't, they don't have life. This is ultimately why, like, for example, ISFPs eat the bread of idleness. They end up becoming idle because from their perspective, there's no goal for them to work on. There's nothing to pursue, right? So they can't be a source of purpose in their life and potentially in the life of other people because there's nothing left to pursue. There's nothing for them to pursue. They don't know what options they have. They don't know what paths are in front of them. Where the ENTJ, it's like, hey, you know, yeah, my pursuits are my purpose. I have a, potentially a bunch of pursuits to actually go for. The thing is, is that they get idle. They get sad when uh, they don't have the resources from which to actually pursue. So the NTJ knows what pursuits there are, whereas the ISFP doesn't know what pursuits are. So it's usually the ISFP, they have a bunch of resources, but they don't even know what to spend those resources on. They don't know what to pursue. Or it's the opposite of the ENTJ. They have a bunch of resources. They just don't know, uh, or they or they, they, they have unlimited pursuits, but they don't have enough resources. So it's this, you know, this game of pursuit versus resource, basically, that they're playing when it comes to understanding their cognitive origin of purpose, ultimately. And this is ultimately where it comes to greed. This is why they are greedy. Greed achieves purpose when the ENTJ or ISFP take present opportunities and invest solely in their own goals. When there are no opportunities present, gratefully ENTJs or ISFPs will either create opportunities for themselves, especially when using their discovery secondary origin, or they will take opportunities from others. When in greed, their purpose and goals stand above everything and everyone else. Greed types often alienate families and friends in the pursuit of their goals. Okay, greed types often do this. Okay. But why? It's a little bit different. Again, ISFPs, they don't know what to pursue. They end up having resources. And sometimes they get those resources from their family, but they don't know what to pursue. And then when they finally find something that they care about, that they want to pursue, it's usually their families or the people closest to them telling them 
that they shouldn't do that pursuit. I actually had a, an ISFP a woman who I was coaching earlier this week. Um, and she told me at one point in time that there was a, a, a particular man in her life that she was pursuing uh, and uh, someone who was highly compatible with her. And the man that she's with now, she is not compatible uh, with him. And she's like, oh my God, Chase, help me, help me, help me, you know? And it's just so interesting because when she was with this very compatible man and she was pursuing him, she was literally gaslit by her family, by her friends. Oh, he's not good enough for you. He's this, he's that. You know, they didn't like how pragmatic uh, this person was. They wanted her to be with someone who was affiliative. They wanted her to be with someone who was like an SFJ, for example, or an FJ, basically. And she's an FP. And, and the thing is, as though her expert in thinking inferior basically started making decisions based on what everyone else was saying. She allowed those people to gaslight her into not pursuing the man of her dreams, basically. And because of that, she lost him. And as soon as she lost him, guess what? She lost her pursuit, which means she lost her purpose. Because her entire purpose was tacked on that. And there's nothing wrong with an ISFP woman tacking her purpose on her pursuit of a particular man. There's nothing wrong with that. It's completely normal. The problem is, is that most people, especially in feminist society, would reject that entirely. Okay? And because of that rejection, society itself is also gaslighting with its feministic Jezebelian bullshit ideals, gaslighting this poor ISFP woman to the point where she's lost X amount of time in terms of her fertility, you know, or I was talking to another ISFP woman who uh, ha who had a conversation with her father. It was it was bloody brilliant. It was bloody brilliant when when she was explaining this to me. But she basically said like, you know, I had to have a conversation with my dad. My dad is like pressuring me to go to school, get an education, and then she's like, yeah, but dad, I want to have a big family one day. That's my pursuit. And by me spending all this time spending all my fertile years on the pursuit of education instead of the pursuit of a big family. You're basically telling me that I can't have the pursuit. I can't have the dream because no one dream, you know, like, like seriously, I can't have the, you know, the, the you know, the INFP is like the, the dreamer or the dreamy type, the dreaming type of the mind temple. The ISFP is the dreamer of the body temple. Basically she tells her dad is like, so you're telling me, that I have to go get this education. But when I do get this education, I I will spend all my fertile years on that and it would be impossible for me to have a big family. And I might only have one, maybe two children because of that. When I could be having children now and have a big family, which is actually what I want, which is actually what my pursuit actually is, dad, right? Yeah. So it's almost like she has to be greedy. She has to be greedy about her pursuit in order to protect her pursuit, okay? Because pursuit is purpose, folks. Pursuit is purpose, okay? That's the point. Pursuit is purpose. And I feel bad. I feel so bad for these ISFP women who live in this society and have to suffer this bullshit. This bullshit that even people who are watching me right now are responsible for bloviating to like everybody else. This bullshit feministic narrative, right? So it's like, what the hell? So yeah. Um anyway. Just just bothers me. It just bothers me to no end. That's why they get greedy. That's why they should be greedy. This is how greed can be good to protect their pursuit. Subjugation. That's why, okay, so anyway, that's often why greed types often alienate families and friends in the pursuit of their goals. Honestly, there are situations where they should be in alienating their families and their friends. I, I even knew like an ISFP who like, an ISFP, uh, you know, an ISFP man who actually like eloped with his wife. Yeah, until he killed himself recently. That was Conrad. You know, because... Everyone is trying to gaslight him and be like, no, she's not good for you. He's that. But he wanted her anyway. He wanted his ENTP girl, and he did. And she was great to him, and he and she loved him dearly until she became part of the problem later. 
Well, after it was, after he was dead, she's just like, yeah, I hella regret everything I did. Yeah, I know. Subjugation. You know, like, you guys got to understand that ESFPs, even ENTJs, the power of words, right? They Words of affirmation really affect those two types. So the power of words, and because they're so sensitive to words of affirmation, and they're not the only types that are sensitive to words of affirmation, there are other ones as well, especially validation types. But validation types and purpose types really live and die on words, right? Words mean so much more, even to the, even more so than actions, okay? They, I mean, they, they live and die by words, not as much as actions. So keep that in mind. Subjugation. Subjugation achieves purpose through the ENTJ and the ISFP controlling and guiding others' efforts to achieve their own personal goals. Subjugating ENTJs and ISFPs expect you to get on the train and realize their own purpose and expect you to happily go along the subjugating ride with them. They expect you to be willing and even enjoy being controlled. This dyad also subjugates themselves in pursuit of their purpose. They will forego comfort and pleasure for the sake of relentlessly achieving their own personal vision. Okay? That's important. That's really important because, um, you know, it's like they're, they're, they're controlling you and maybe even enslaving you so that they can achieve their own personal goals. But at the same time, they're going to help you along the way. Now, granted, some ENTJs and ISFPs can take this way too far and actually harm other people. This is why like, for example, Ghislaine Maxwell, uh, Jeffrey Epstein's madame, basically, who would set him up with girls uh, that they would be trafficking, basically, to high-profile people. Uh, she's a sex trafficker, and she herself is an ENTJ, a subjugating ENTJ, right? Which is which sucks. You know, she's unconscious developed as a, as a subjugating uh, ENTJ, and that's how far it could go. Like, so it can be a bad thing. But subjugation can also be a good thing. Because sometimes people are so directionless that it's like the, the ENTJ and the ISFP is looking at someone. It's like, hey, I have purpose. I see you have no purpose. I'm going to control you. I'm going to enslave you. And I'm going to give you a purpose. And then, boom, those people are given a purpose when they never actually had a purpose before. And eventually, those people end up becoming grateful to their subjugator. Pretty cool. And then there's complacency, which is arguably the most difficult part to understand. So I'm actually going to be comparing it to credulity on the INFP side within the mind temple to uh, further draw a contrast uh, into complacency. So complacency achieves purpose through believing in the significance of one's own achievements, imagined or otherwise. Complacency provides a self-satisfaction with what one has achieved. There is an unmistakable restlessness with subjugating ENTJs and ISFPs, but in complacency, they allow themselves much more leisure. Ignorance is bliss drives complacency, where the feeling of what they believe is elevated above everything else. So let's examine that for a second. Ignorance is bliss, right? Ignorance is bliss. When you look at an INFP, they're very credulous, right? So they are outsourcing their thinking to other people because the INFP wants to play it safe. And if they outsource their thinking to other people, it's like, hey, ignorance is safety, right? Ignorance is safety. I am choosing to be ignorant by outsourcing my thoughts to other people so that I can be safe or be seen as a safe person, right? That's what the INFP wants to look like. The ISFP is more like, hey, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to outsource my thinking to others. I'm going to uh, choose to keep my head in the sense. I'm going to choose to remain ignorant because then I don't have to deal with the consequences of having the knowledge. Because out of the 16 types, for example, an ISFP understands, uh, and, and even ENTJs as well, but especially ISFPs, they understand that they have a lot more personal responsibility when they know. Because no one understands the old adage, you are responsible for what you know more than an ISFP with their TI demon. They know. They know that the more they know, the more responsibility they have. So in an effort to shirk responsibility, they have to make sure that sometimes they turn their ears off to prevent them from getting additional knowledge in their head where they literally just decide to not listen. This is one of the reasons why complacent ISFPs bother the ever-loving shit out of me. 
It's why uh, any ISFPs in my life that I've had relationships with, they've never been subconscious developed. They've never been complacent because that complacency, it's like they just automatically dismiss my TI parent. How dare my TI parent, okay? How dare my TI parent shatter their worldview? How dare my TI parent shove knowledge down their throat or up their ass, basically? I get it into them somehow. I get that knowledge into them somehow. There's a t-shirt, right? Like, uh, I do that, okay? Even against their will with my TI parent, because I know that they will be forced to act more responsible. And they're like, why are you making me more responsible by giving me knowledge? I don't want any more knowledge because then that means I have to be responsible. That means I actually have to put in some effort. That means I can't be idle anymore. Gross. So complacent ISFPs really, really bother me because of that point of view. Because it's literally ignorance is bliss, okay? They are literally trying to be ignorant as a way to shirk responsibility. It's insanely immature. I don't like it. I really don't like it. That's not to say that complacency can't be a bad thing. Because at the same time, complacency can make them insanely naive. And that could be really attractive to a lot of people. But the thing is, though, is that I'm UDUF, like my, the way that, the way that I personally live my life, you know, with my TI parent, I cannot, I cannot handle being dismissed. I cannot handle being placated and it's complacent ISFPs and ENTJs that placate other people. And I've noticed that it's complacent ISFPs who prefer to be with TI inferiors and TI childs. So SFJs, complacent ISFPs often prefer to be with the FJs because their TI is not so strong, but it is the subjugating uh, ENTJs and ISFPs, but subjugating ISFPs especially, who prefer to be with TI parents and TI hero, okay? Because uh, they're trying to get away from the ignorance. They don't want to be ignorant. They would rather give somebody a purpose or help someone find their purpose and then make and then share their purpose with another person and make that other person's purpose their own purpose and be able to achieve their pursuits that way instead of just going around life being aimless and complacent because ignorance is bliss you know because complacency is just ultimately an avoidance of responsibility it is willful ignorance right but then that naivete could grow eventually and that naivete could could provide you know some old miser like myself, I don't know, or some, uh, you know, bitter old man, you know, some joy through the naivete of, of a complacent uh, ISFP or ENTJ. It's possible, but still, like, so I'm just, I'm just sharing, you know, what my preference is and why, so you guys understand the difference. So, yeah. Okay. So, um, let's move on to the next one. So internal, okay, so the origins can be expressed internally and externally. ESFJs and INTPs can be sources of discovery for others, but also consumers of discovery. Consuming discovery is supplied through a source of purpose, showing the complementary origin that fuels the ESFJs and INTPs origin. ENTJs and ISFPs can be sources and consumers of purpose. Consuming purpose is empowered through discovery, whereas the source of purpose stimulates uh, new discoveries. So this, so so why does it matter? It's because we're leading up to something important here, and, and it's the one thing that we always talk about within these lectures, and that is ultimately the golden rule, okay, which applies directly to cognitive origins because cognitive origins don't change with people; they're always the same. Doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter where you come from, doesn't matter how you were born, doesn't matter the color of your skin, doesn't matter what your life story is or what your nurture is or whatever. Cognitive origin is the one piece of human nature that never actually changes. This is why it is the absolute best vector when you're typing somebody from the type grid perspective. But the golden rule absolutely applies directly to cognitive origins because cognitive origins are the thing that people want the most out of life because it is written. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. So in everything, do unto others what you would have them do unto you. This is also known as the law of reciprocity. Okay. Quote, in order to achieve our cognitive origins, we need to give them to others. 
like I tell INTJs who want deep respect, AKA reverence. And I'm like, show respect and you'll be given respect, right? So ESFJs and INTPs should consider ways they create discovery in other people and others will provide them with exploration too. Create an engine of exploration by helping other people explore so that people will want to explore with you. Similarly with ENTJs and ISFPs, should give other people's purpose, tangible achievements, help people with their pursuits, and invest in others so that others will invest in them and help them find their purpose, others and their own. That's literally how it is. It's the law of reciprocity, folks. So while we as humanity seek to have each of our origins filled, they're also the greatest gifts we can give to other people. None of the 16 types can give people a path to explore better than an ESFJ or an INTP. And no one can inspire a sense of purpose more than the ENTJ and ISFP, as well as either share their own pursuits or discover what other pursuits are out there and help bring people around that point of view. Remember, purpose equals pursuit. And without pursuit, there is no purpose, right? Without nothing to explore, there is no discovery, okay? That's what it is all about, folks. This is literally how these two types live life, or these four types live life. That is, in essence, what the body temple actually is, all right? So there you go. Cognitive origins according to the body temple. Thanks for watching, folks, and I'll see you guys next month uh, for season 18, Cognitive Mechanics. Later.